Hello and welcome. My name is Tara Russo and I work as an educational consultant for Pennsylvania's Training and Technical Assistance Network. As part of my role at Patton, I'm a contributing partner to the Multi-Tiered System of Support Initiative. This video, Evidence-Based Practices for Mathematics Instruction, an introduction to word problems, will address reasons students may struggle with word problems and strategies you can include in your instruction to support them. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. Pennsylvania's multi-tiered system of support is a standards-aligned comprehensive school improvement framework for enhancing both academic and behavioral health outcomes for all students. In Pennsylvania, Response to Intervention, or RTI, refers to the methodology that is used to determine how slow is slow and how low is low as an alternative to ability achievement discrepancy within the specific learning disability determination process. Pennsylvania's MTSS model represents an integrated system, meaning that cross-disciplinary teams use a problem-solving process to facilitate shared ownership for achieving academic and behavioral goals using a continuum of evidence-based practices and reliable and valid data sources. The academic side of MTSS, standards align, high quality core literacy, mathematics, and STEM instruction is delivered within the context of culturally responsive practices, positive behavior supports, and family engagement. There are key components that form the foundation of PA's MTSS framework. If a well-articulated, well-designed tiered system is in place, you should realize efficient, effective, and sustainable outcomes. PA's critical components are multiple tiers of instruction and intervention, problem-solving process, data evaluation, communication and collaboration, capacity-building infrastructure, and leadership. Today we will focus on PA's critical component, multiple tiers of instruction and intervention. In an MTSS framework, all students receive high-quality core instruction and, if needed, receive supports and interventions. Allow this triangle to represent 100% of students. When considering instructional intensity in an MTSS framework, all students receive instruction at one of three tiers. The tiers are Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. As the tiers increase, so does instructional intensity. However, group sizes decrease due to a lesser number of students requiring intensive interventions. Tier 1 contains all students. About 80% of students will experience success from receiving high quality core instruction. Tier two will contain roughly 15% of students. Students at this tier receive core instruction in addition to supplemental targeted interventions. Tier three contains 5% of students. These students need intensive interventions in addition to core instruction. At this tier, students receive individual interventions unique to their learning needs. The learning intentions or statements of what is intended to be learned from this video are for you to be able to identify reasons students may struggle when solving word problems, define how general solution strategies can be used during core instruction, and explain how schema-based instruction can support students at Tier 2 and Tier 3. Let's begin by addressing ways we can support students when solving word problems. Here are two common misconceptions taught to students when learning word problems. Teaching tips and tricks, emphasizing keywords and word problems. Let's dive a little deeper into those common misconceptions. I think we would agree that there are essential parts of a word problem that are needed to solve it. These parts are the critical numbers and quantities used in the word problem, labels that define the numbers and quantities, such as money, temperature, animals, etc. The question being asked, the operation used to find the solution to the word problem, 
and the keywords present to support students when making sense of the problem. I'm going to highlight math words. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Math words are appropriate to use, however should not be tied to operations. Many students are taught that magic math words will always help them identify the operation being used on a word problem. This misconception expires in third grade when students begin solving multiplication and division word problems. If you would like to read about additional rules and misconceptions that expire in the elementary grades, read 13 Rules That Expire by Karen Karp, Sarah Bush, and Barbara Daugherty. Do you use a math word list similar to these when teaching word problems? I would ask you to reconsider the strategy. Math words should not be taught as a shortcut to finding the operation needed to solve a word problem. This is when the keyword strategy becomes especially problematic. Here is a word problem similar to one your students may see. Joseph took the 23 baseball cards he no longer wanted and gave them to Brandon. Now Joseph has 62 baseball cards left. How many baseball cards did Joseph have before giving Brandon the ones he no longer wanted? Well, let's consider the use of the word left in this word problem. Children may focus on the keyword left and decide the operation to use when finding the solution is subtraction. But if you read the problem carefully, the problem requires addition to find the proper solution, not subtraction. Here is another example of why keywords should not be used in isolation. Samantha has three quarters in her right pocket. She gets five dimes in her left pocket. How much money does Samantha have? In this example, the word left represents Samantha's left pocket. Just looking at the math word left would mislead the students when finding the solution. Addition is the correct operation to use to find the total amount of money Samantha has, not subtraction. We looked at the keyword strategy and considered how this one approach can be problematic for students. Let's focus on our students with disabilities word problems may pose to be especially challenging to them. So what does research tell us about why students with disabilities may struggle when solving word problems? They may lack the ability to select the correct strategy to apply to situations. They may struggle with comprehension of the text in the word problem. They may have difficulty applying a strategy to solve a math problem. They may have difficulty deciding which operation to use and they may lack metacognitive skills needed to self-monitor progress and make corrections when needed. Students with disabilities, however, can learn to regulate both behavior and attention to task, as well as academic accuracy and production. Educators need to explicitly instruct students to acquire the self-regulatory strategies of self-instruction, self-questioning, and self-checking. For example, in terms of word problem solving, Self-instruction involves students reading the problem and telling themselves what to do. Self-questioning has to do with asking themselves questions as they go about solving the problem. Self-checking has to do with students checking over their work to make sure that it is complete, accurate, and that their answers make sense. Traditionally, students learn to solve math word problems by taking note of keywords. However, Asha Dechandra, professor of educational psychology at the University of Minnesota, wrote in an article she published on solving math word problems that the keyword strategy often leads students astray from what the problem is asking and in turn, students may miss out on the big picture. As a result, teachers have shifted towards general solution instruction, or GSI, for word problems emphasizing language comprehension and providing students with an all-purpose plan of attack. General solution instruction may include the use of a mnemonic as the means to recall their plan of attack when solving a word problem. A mnemonic is an effective self-regulation strategy that helps students recall the steps to solve word problems. They promote metacognition. By promoting metacognition, we are asking students to ask themselves questions as they go about solving the problem and asking them to check over their work to make sure that it is complete, accurate, and that their answers make sense. Additionally, mnemonics explicitly and systematically progress students through word problems. 
There are various mnemonic devices to choose from that support students when trying to solve a word problem. We chose to use the UPS check, which was introduced by George Polia in 1945 to encourage a more systematic process for problem solving in mathematics. So what is the UPS check? The U stands for understand. P, plan. S, solve. And check. Check your work. What does it mean to understand a problem? What is the problem asking you to do? What are the labels being used? Can you restate the problem in your own words? Is there enough information to solve the problem? And P, plan. What strategy can I use to solve the problem? What operation will I use? How can I set the problem up to be solved? The U and the P in the UPS check are both self-instruction and self-questioning strategies. What does this S mean in solve? To write a number sentence to show my thinking and to solve the problem. That is a self-instruction and self-questioning strategy. The check stands for did I answer the question the problem was asking? Did I check to make sure my answer is correct? Does my answer make sense? This is self-checking. Let's shift from general solution instruction to schema-based instruction. Though general solution instruction is an improvement over the keyword method, many students get stuck on the first step. They have trouble making sense of the problem. The shift to schema-based instruction is so students can see the underlying structure of a word problem that can be generalized in their current grade and future grades. It has been shown to be an effective research-based strategy for students that struggle. With schema-based instruction, students learn to categorize word problems into a few different types and apply a tailor-made plan to figure out the solution. How does schema-based instruction support struggling learners? It provides students with schematic diagrams to classify word problems by their schema. The schematic diagrams are explicitly taught. Teachers use think alouds to model the steps for solving a word problem, while also providing context as to why these steps are important. Also, teachers purposefully select the models and worked examples they use with their students. There are three steps associated with schema-based instruction. First, identify a word problem as belonging to a problem type. Second, use specific problem type schemas. Third, use the structure of the word problem to solve the problem. You may be wondering when it is appropriate to introduce schema-based instruction to your students. To answer this question, let's consider the six stages of learning defined by Mercer and Mercer in their 2005 book, Teaching Students with Learning Problems. Schema-based instruction occurs at stage five of the learning process. What does instruction look like at stage five? Allow me to define each stage for you so you have an understanding of the progression through all six stages. Stage one, initial acquisition. The learner's performance with the intended skill ranges from 0% accuracy to 90 to 100% accuracy. Teachers should use tactics such as rationales for learning a specific skill, demonstrations, models, and cues. Stage 2. Advanced Acquisition Teachers should use tactics such as error correction, rewards for accuracy, and criterion evaluation. Stage one, stages 1 and 2 should include a variety of strategies to help the learner acquire the intended skill. During these two stages, the instructional goals should focus on helping the student perform the skill accurately and quickly. Stage 3, Proficiency. In this stage, the learner attempts to learn the skill at an almost automatic level. Teachers should use tactics that focus on increasing the learner's performance speed. At this stage, a high level of learning occurs, resulting in the learner being able to complete a task associated with that skill quickly and accurately. Stage four, maintenance. The instructional goal at this stage is to maintain the high level of performance acquired during the subsequent stages. Students are expected to retain both accuracy and fluency once direct instruction and reinforcement have been withdrawn. 
students with learning problems frequently encounter much difficulty at this level because it requires the retention of the skill. Stage five, generalization. At this stage, the learner is able to apply the skill at various times, settings, and with different people. Research has shown that generalization does not readily occur with students who have learning problems. Generalization must be systematically taught. For this reason, stage five is especially challenging for struggling students. Stage six, adaption. This stage is thought of as the problem solving stage. A learner at this stage is able to apply a previously learned skill in a new area of application without direct instruction or guidance. David Alsup, Maggie Kiger, and Luann Lovin note in their book, Teaching Mathematics Meaningfully, that the six stages are not absolute, yet should be thought of as significant points across a continuum. It may occur that struggling students skip stages, which can result in an unstable understanding of a concept or skill. Now that you have an idea of the instructional strategies that should be taught to your students prior to introducing them to schema-based instruction, let's take a look at the four additive schemas. We will begin with the total schema. This schema helps students see that a whole is equal to the sum of its parts and organizes addition word problems by defining their part-whole relationship. The total schema is parts being put together for a total. So the schematic diagram shows part one plus part two equaling the total. You can also create an equation, P1 plus P2 equals T. The next additive schema is the difference schema. If a word problem is defined as belonging to the difference schema, there are two sets being compared and students need to identify the difference in value between the two sets. When using the difference schema, we identify the larger quantity and subtract the smaller quantity from it to find their difference. The equation for the difference schema is B minus S equals D. The last two additive schemas are the change increase and change decrease schemas. With both schemas, you start with a beginning amount and it either increases or decreases, resulting in the ending amount. Change problems occur over a period of time. The diagrams for the change increase and change decrease schemas are the same. With change increase, we are talking about one thing increasing over a period of time, such as the temperature rising. The equation for a change increase word problem is ST plus C equals E, so the starting amount plus the change equals the ending amount. Change decrease word problems have one thing decreasing over a period of time such as the amount of money someone has after purchasing something. The equation for a change decrease word problem is ST minus C equals E. The starting amount minus the change equals the ending amount. Let's revisit our learning intentions. Today we identified reasons students may struggle when solving word problems, defined how general solution strategies can be used during core instruction, and explained how schema-based instruction can support students at Tier 2 and Tier 3. Thank you for watching. Please visit Patton's website at www.patton.net to learn more about the MTSS and mathematics initiatives.